In the late 1970s, a group of psychologists from Harvard put together this study. It became one of the most famous studies coming out of Harvard. And uh, in this test, they were trying to assess one's ability to focus. So uh, they produced a video, and the goal of the video was this, is you had two teams, one with white shirts on and one with black shirts on, and you had to count the number of passes the team in the white shirts made. Now, I've shared this a few times uh, in this church, but I felt that there's a specific point we need to get from this. So you're gonna be active participants in this study. There's a modern video that was made a couple years ago. The formatting's off a little bit for those tech nerds in the audience right now. But I want you to practice along with this. So your goal is to count the passes. The instructions are gonna be brief. Count the passes the team in the white shirts make. All right, Nick, we ready? Let's do this. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But, did you see the moonwalking bear? No! The awareness test. How many think the person next to you actually missed the moonwalking bear? Lift your hand, be your hand. That's actually a test in itself. Often you'll share what you missed based off the person next to you and that assumption. Anyways, there you go. We miss it. Now, the, the shocking result of this was the original test was with a gorilla suit, uh, but now they've modernized it a little bit. A lot of us miss the moonwalking bear. They believe that in their tests, nearly 70% of all participants miss the unexpected stimulus. It's called unintentional blindness. Here's the definition. An individual fails to recognize an unexpected activity that is in plain sight. And the cause of this is we get so stuck into normality or the routine that we miss the unexpected. Now, all of us sitting here would say, I would never miss something that obvious. Never would miss something that obvious. But what I believe is this, that phenomenon is most common in our relationship with God. That phenomenon is most common in our relationship with God. We become so tunnel visioned, so set on normal, so focused on our routine, so focused on the natural, we miss the supernatural. We become so focused on the natural. Our, our schedules are so full, there's no room for the supernatural. And God's spirit and activity is around us all the time, but he's inviting us to partner with it. We're like that man at the pool of Bethesda or Bethsaida, whatever we want to interpret it. And he sits there in front of that pool, and he's standing next to Jesus and says, no one's here to lift me in when there's a miracle waiting to happen, standing right next to him. Get this all the time. Why don't we see the miraculous like in the first century? Why don't we see miracles like in revivals past? Let me let you into a little secret. The problem isn't with God. It's us. He's ready. He's willing. He's active. The problem is, most of the time, we don't have time for it. We're so focused on our perfect American lives, or at least keeping up the outer shell that we want people to see on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. We're so good at it, protecting and preserving this shell. And an entrepreneur named Seth Godin had this brilliant point for entrepreneurs where they say, why can't my business succeed? Why, why do I have these ideas and why don't my businesses succeed? And so he drew this illustration and he called it the comfort zone. He said this, the problem is that why your business doesn't succeed is because you live in the comfort zone. The only thing you need to realize, do we have that picture? Is that outside the comfort zone is where the magic happens. I'm gonna alter this slightly. The reason why we don't see the spirit activity we're contending for 
is because it's outside the comfort zone the miraculous happens. We get so locked into our box, so locked into our normal, we get tunnel vision, and when an opportunity arises, ain't nobody got time for that. We don't make the room for the Spirit's activity. Chad, I'm warning you, what I plan on sharing is not happening, so just be prepared. We are calling and asking, I believe that God's Spirit is speaking to our church to contend for an outpouring of His Spirit. An outpouring of the latter rain of God's movement and his activity among us. And we have seen miracles, church. We have seen the movement happening. I'm telling you, the waters are being stirred, but it's not in a located pool. It's a stirring of the well within us that God is asking for. And you say, I got nothing to give. I got nothing within. Let me tell you, I know a source and his name is Jesus. And he's got living water we're called to tap into. Proverbs 5 Verse 15, sorry, cup. It's fine. It's living water. Get over it. Thank you, Sean. Faithful. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. My friends in water conservation always talk about the droughts that Sacramento has. They say, here's the problem. When it rains, we have no system to store it. And we ask, why has God's spirit not been poured out? Because we have no system to sustain it. And it's actually in his mercy and his grace that he prevents outpouring until we're ready. I remember one time, thank you so much, my friend Tracy. I remember one time, Driving, and, and again, don't, if you think you think I know what church I'm talking about, I'm, it's not that church, I promise. Um, I, I, got, I got exposed to some dirty business dealings and practices of a church. I've seen behind the eyes too many times. And I was really angry. I said, Lord, why, why would you allow that to happen? And he says, they're my net. Build a bigger boat. I said, Okay. I said, okay. We need to contend and believe that these wells that God has called us to cultivate can hold an outpouring of his spirit. That can hold what he's intended us to carry. That miracles can happen in our midst. And I felt this morning, as, as I was texting a friend, I texted a friend that, that, that were believing for healing of their cancer and then the Purcells share it. And I saw Dave, I'm like, we're gonna go after this this morning. So other friends here that have not been here for a long time that I know are battling with physical infirmity that God wants to heal. We want to partner with that journey. If it's instantaneous or it takes some time, we're here to pray and contend. Those watching online that are believing for healing for themselves or a family member, we're here to contend and believe for that. But folks, we have to believe and we have to get outside of our comfort zone. And guess what? It gets messy. We have to remember the Savior of the world was not born in a four-walled, clean church, he was born in a manger, a dirty, filthy place. And guess what? Where many oxen are, there's a lot of mess. And I'm going to tell you, when you see an outpouring of God's Spirit, there are not a lot of theological explanations that make sense. Go on the mission field. Talk to Pastor Bob. Your theology will change really quick. When you start to confront things and you're asked questions about things and you see spirit activity take place, it causes you to say, you know what? I believe this word is living and active and sharper than any two just sword, but I need to know the word. And his name is Jesus. And your dependency grows on him. And here's my challenge to us this morning. As you cultivate a well within, I'm just gonna warn you, I'm not always practical when I share. I'm sorry. My goal is that there's a move inside of your spirit and soul that says, you know what, God? I didn't walk away with practical tools, but Holy Spirit, teach me. Teach me what I need to do with what was shared. I'm praying for movement. And my antennas are up as I'm hearing households getting saved. And here's the beauty of what God's doing in our community right now. There's a couple that's been coming, a girl I've been praying for for several years. Never met her. But as, as they come, this household's now getting saved and they came in through these four walls. However, at the same time, parallel time, there's a couple that gets saved that's never been in the four walls ever, but they got saved in an Acts 2 community. 
And my antennas are up saying God wants to move in both ways. And he'll move in the old way, but there's also a new way. And God wants us to hold the tension between the two. And he wants us to believe that this outpouring may not look like you've seen it before. Guess what? It may not look like seven days a week, seven nights like it was in the renewal when I was a child, which I hated. Going to church and sitting in childcare for five hours. That was not a win, but it might be in your houses where you could tuck your kids to bed. Who knows? We want to say we want to be open for this. And here's my challenge theologically, is that we know that Jesus is the source of living water. We know that's him. But John 7 doesn't say that. We use the phrase living water throughout John. John 7 says this, and I think I want us to hold this tension, and those are going to be sticklers over this. I'm sorry. But he says, come to me, those that are thirsty. And to those that believe, out of the heart of the believer will flow living water. See, our responsibility is to tap into the source of Jesus, but we're called to be stewards of that living water that others can draw from. And we have to have, and again, you're going to be a broken cistern. That's the goal, is that it leaks out of you. I'm believing that our church would have these wells within, so when the outpouring comes, you can sustain what God is doing in you and your family. I've seen too many revivals die, and it's not God's fault. It's often us. And there's brokenness, and there's pride, and the Jezebel spirit comes in. There's all of that, and guess what? We are weak, fallible people, but God is asking us to cry out in humility for a move of his spirit because we are in desperate need of it. As I shared in the beginning, we're on a five-year clock. We're two years in. We are seeing the radical change of the modern American church, and we need to contend for an outpouring of his spirit now that will sustain through the difficult times. This is not the end of hard times. It's the beginning. I hate to warn you, but we serve a good God that helps us in the hard times. This is our story. This is our journey. My friend Chad's going to share very briefly. And when he was in a church, there was a move of the Spirit. But this is my warning I feel for us today. If you want to read about John 2, the notes will be online. But this is what I feel today, is that when we begin to contend for the things of the Spirit, the religious Spirit also likes to creep in. And I, I really feel cautioned for us to hear this. And I've seen this happen too many times. And as I've watched chronologically, we were part of a move of God in 2010 that, that encountered many other communities. But there's also another move in 2013 in our city. And I saw the religious spirit cannibalize it in many people's lives. And many of them survived out of that and have continued on. But my friend Chad just had a, had a really tough journey. And I saw how they stewarded the gifts of the Spirit in a church context, even though the religious spirit was fighting against them. Would you welcome my friend, Chad Solstrom, as he shares. Hey, guys. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> everything that is on my heart to share in context of what we lived through is what Brandon just shared in the whole of his, his message. And so um, that's the connection, is just bringing into the practical everyday of life. So what we went through was, uh, I was at a church and I was pastoring at this church and it was the first time in my life, I had grown up in churches where the Holy Spirit was acknowledged but never a part of the experience. I went to the leading theological seminary on cessationist theology, which means the gifts are dead. Um, and so then I, and I did never sat well in my spirit, but I, I ended up, you know, finding my way longer stories for another day at a church. And for the first time in my Christian experience, believer my whole life as a community, we said, let's pursue the Holy Spirit and the gifts and invite him to show up first time ever in the context. And he did. And he showed up, and all of a sudden, what started happening was God was breaking through in lives, but this is the thing, is it wasn't necessarily happening through the Sunday. It wasn't necessarily happening through the preaching or through the time of gathering together. All of a sudden, dreams were showing up for some people and prophetic songs, like really cool stuff, and then healings and miracles outside of just what we were experiencing on Sundays. And to make a long story short, two things begin to happen at that time. For some, we begin to say, this is what we were made for, and how do we get more of this? And for others, it was, this is not what we expected. This was messy. How do we get this back in the container? And that was really the beginning of the end of our journey with that community. And again, it's a long, painful story, but for my wife and I, things locked into place that we had been craving our whole life, right? 
But so I, it's a funny thing because I think everything Brandon's sharing is exactly right on, in my spirit of where we're at in this time and in Roseville, California, that we are, uh, he was going to do the water to wine miracle. That was one of like five different messages that were going to come out this morning. And there's a time where they have to dip into the old water cistern, not knowing what's going to come out and prepare to serve that to a party. And there's a tension and an awkwardness and a like uncomfortable, what in the world are we doing before you realize what Jesus has done. And that's, that's where I feel like we are at. And so I, I, I've been in the communities before. I think it was just a foretaste what we experienced at that church of what it was like to start to move. And what I want to share with you is a couple of, um, I don't think warnings is the right word, but a couple of things that will get in the way that will stifle it. Because um, this is what I saw and experienced is one is fear of man, Absolutely, we know this, right? Individually, your biggest hindrance to God moving your life is fear of man. If you don't know that yet, just acknowledge it and let's start moving past it. Um, number one, for me, it's, it's one-to-one. Fear of man or moving the spirit. I don't know what it's like for anybody else. Uh, and then the second thing is trying to fit it back in what we've done before or what's gone before, what I'm comfortable with. Movements of the spirit are messy and I would even say as far as chaotic, but it's so ordered in the spirit. It's just the natural, like... You, this, is, this is the one thing I felt from that, the water to wine, and I don't, and hopefully, whatever. <laughs> Just, is you need to get comfortable with the fact that Jesus serves stronger wine to drunk people. <laughs> and until you're comfortable with that, like there's more to let go of for God to move in the spirit. Right? Do a little bit of historical context research and you will see that Jesus served stronger wine, which meant more alcohol, to drunk people. And that was his first thing. And obviously that's not the point of the miracle, but you're gonna miss the point if you can't handle that. And I don't want us to miss the point because it's coming in a chaotic or weird or uncomfortable way. I want us to see the fullness that it's no longer where we go to make ourselves clean, but it's what Jesus supplies through his living wine. The next time he served wine was around the communion table saying, this is my, my blood shed for you, right? So that miracle was for us too, it was for all believers. And so don't be surprised when we start moving into an uncomfortable space that looks messy and we're like, ah, but what about this and this? Um, because I don't want us to squelch it, to rein it in, or to try and fit it back in the old thing. And that's what I, I felt I'm supposed to share for today, is to not hold on to those things in a way that stifles, because I've seen it done, and now I've seen it done multiple times, and um, that's what I want for us. So we're going to move into some praying. Let's stand together. We're going to go for this. Man, look at this. We're so on time, Chad. What's that? I'm so impressed with us. I'm, I'm this is great. That's the miracle. Uh, worship team's going to come up now. Um, we're just going to pray here for a minute. I, I really want you to know, like, I've been, I, I was a part of renewal. I'm not, we're not after weird. Weird is rooted in witchcraft, FYI. That's where that word comes from. Uh, but we are in to the Spirit's work. That's the difference. And we may not understand, but we will steward the best we can. We want you to know we have a team that is passionate about theology and we're passionate about God's word. And we need a new wineskin. We need something new where our heart needs to be there. And, and he wants to use us. Again, when you think of that miracle of water and wine, I may share it still in a couple of weeks, but we'll just cut to the chase here. There were six empty vessels and they were part of an old religious practice. However, God still used it. He wants to use the old. And the second thing is, six in Jewish historicalness falls short of perfection, but it's also the number of, hum of man. And God wants to use the brokenness and inadequacy of your humanity to create a new wine within us. So your story is not invalid. You know, I was praying this week and I was talking to a friend. I was like, man, I just want to be the church of messed up people. Like, let's just make that our calling card. If, like, if you're messed up, you found a home because we're messed up too. That we're after this. We're after messy. If you got it together, I'm sorry. You found the wrong place. We all have messed up. Every leader here has a messed up life. We're pursuing the holiness of God. 
together in weakness and brokenness. So just eyes closed. Holy Spirit, we are asking for an outpouring of your spirit. We come against the religious spirit. We come against those old wells within us. This week I, I texted a, a, a friend and mentor named Lou Engel, and he wrote a, a, a book over 20 years ago called Digging the Wells of Revival. And The Rock gave its first generous financial gift was to help fund that book. I, I feel this is twofold. God wants to build a new well, but he wants to rediggle the old wells. And Bonita is a stewardship. And I, we weren't able to share it this morning, but at the end of the month, we're preparing. We're gonna begin to do monthly prayer gathering and worship gatherings there. We believe we're called to steward the presence together. And it's gonna be intimate. It's gonna be not professional. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna have four or five hours of extended time of prayer and worship together. But this is, our, this is our stewardship. This is our responsibility. It's the both ends. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you for what you're doing. Eyes closed. God, we, we just say, fill these empty vessels. Fill these empty vessels. Pour out the Spirit. We say, release the rain within us. Release the new wine within us. God, you are at work and you're doing things. And we ask God for any old religious ways that you would disturb us. Just even right now, I sense that spirit of fear like, oh no, what, what if it gets out of control? God, we break the yoke of control this morning. With eyes closed, you see, you know what? You're a recovering control addict. Lift your hand up right now. Father, we declare, break the yoke of control over us that we'd be sensitive to the move of the Spirit, that we'd steward what you have in store for us, that confusion, that anxiety. That ang right now, I just feel it creeping up. God, we, we surrender confusion. We surrender anxiety. We, we surrender all those things we're, we're fighting against. And we ask, Holy Spirit, do a fresh work. Chad, I want you to pray. Yes, God, we, we come to you letting go of what we known and what we can do and what we're capable of to receive what you have and what you want to give and what you're capable of God and we ask it to take whatever shape and form that you want it to and I speak to every heart here right now that wants more but doesn't know that um, or has an experience or doubts that your goodness and your miracles can break through in their everyday life and I speak to the everyday mundane life where there's problems that they cannot solve in their own means and ask that you would move in your spirit and solve it on their behalf that you would go ahead and before and through them and that you would all along the way as you're moving them into a new place that you'd whisper in their ear, you are my son, you are my daughter, I am proud of you. That it's not just miracles as if it's some elusive thing, it's your goodness breaking through in everyday life. It's your nature all the time, every day and that they don't need to achieve a thing, they need to receive what you're doing and who you are on their behalf. And I pray that you begin to shape us more and more like you to where it becomes our everyday thing, our normal thing, our MO, our way of going about life, more of you, Jesus. And so we just release that into this time, God, and we give you permission to take us places that we didn't expect to go through your power, that we didn't uh, fully surrender and know that we have in us, God. Take the party up a notch, serve the stronger wine. We wanna receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you.